In chapters 11 and 12, you get a snapshot of David. So far, we have seen that David has now been the anointed king. He has been king for quite some time. He has been extremely successful. Can anybody remember or remind me what we've been talking about in the previous few chapters? About what, what had David been successful in that's been emphasized the last three or four chapters? What was that? He well a little bit earlier, right? Right. Uh, yeah, but he he how he did it, he was blessed as far as his conquest what? Expanding the territories. That's right. That's right. He's already got his hand up. Uh, and like I said, I mean, it's you got it at your own risk. At your own risk. Uh, we do not offer insurance. Okay, so. <laughs> so yes, his success militarily. And so it's really interesting now that we start these few chapters that we're going to find out that while David has been advancing as far as his military, he's taking more and more uh, territory, uh, military-wise. Uh, we're going to see that he does something that he probably shouldn't do. Let's look at verses 1 through 3. In the spring of the year, when the time when the kings would go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel. And they ravaged the Am Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one of them said, Is it not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And so here we have in the first three vo verses, David avoids a responsibility. What responsibility does the text tell us that was? All right. The first one I heard was Miss Holton. He was supposed to be leading in battle. We haven't really had a, a president or commander-in-chief lead actual army forces. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, since probably General Washington in the Revolutionary War. Is that right? Am I wrong? He wasn't even telling the president at the time, right? So it's not customary for our political leaders to be leading men in battle, but that was the custom in the ancient Near Eastern world. There was a standard, and David was not living up to that standard. It's interesting here that did David sin and fall in one of the hardest times of his life? One of the best, right? I mean, look at the things that David had to endure as he was on the run from Saul. And his family was, his family was refugees in a foreign country. David is strong and resilient, even in the face of danger, even almost death. But here he has finally been crowned king after waiting for 20 years. He has more money than he can do anything with. He's got more land, more territory, and he's about to wipe out the last good kingdom or the last great kingdom that's around him. So the sin... It doesn't attack us when we're at our lowest points because then we rely on God for strength and resiliency. When does Satan oftentimes come knocking on our door? Things are good, right? Uh, what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians? Take heed lest you fall, right? And so we're, none of us are immune. And so Satan attacked David while he was at his greatest. Our greatest battles usually don't come when we're out there working hard, uh, but when we're out there enjoying leisure, we've got time on our hands. There's an old idiom, I guess you would call it, an idle mind. It's a devil's workshop, right? Uh, there's some truth to that, right? David should have been out in the battlefield, but yet he wasn't, and he failed to attack. Interesting here, Bathsheba's father is who? If you want candy, you've got to be loud. I can't... <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, he was the son of Ahithophel, David's counselor. We're told that in chapter 15 and chapter 23. Interestingly enough, Ahithophel, even though he's a counselor of the king David, when David's son Absalom revolts against the king and he starts trying to cause a civil war, Ahithophel is one of the counselors that actually goes with Absalom the son. 
So some have speculated maybe he was still a little bitter by the things that had taken place with his granddaughter, right? And so Bathsheba becomes pregnant. Verses 4 and 5 tells us this. It says, So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanliness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman was conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. David was born in about 1041 B.C. And this incident took place in 992 B.C. And so David was just about the age of 50 when he committed this adultery. Um, we're not immune to any type of temptation, right? Whether we're 17 or whether we're 50. David was nearly 50 years old and he had multiple wives, at least six or seven at this point, possibly more, and he had multiple concubines. And yet, that desire was still in front of him. Um, the only thing that can, can, that can cure desire is our focus and faith in God. Nothing else can cover it up. And so she becomes pregnant. And so David figures out, I've got to do something. And so let's see what David tries to do in verses 6 through 9. So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out to the king's house, and there he followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. Uh, what does... Well, let me just say, wash your feet is a ancient Near Eastern idiom for sexual contact. Um, it's used in Exodus 4.25, Deuteronomy 28.57, Isaiah 7.20. It's not being literal, because when you read that phrase there, wash your feet, you're like, that makes no sense whatsoever. Basically, David is telling Uriah to go home and sleep with his wife. You've been out in the field with your buddies, you've been fighting hard, go home and enjoy the, you know, this what God said you... Go home and enjoy what God said you can enjoy when you're married, right? I mean, it's basically what he's trying to say, right? And so he tries to cover it up that type of way, but Uriah decides he's not going to do that. What does Uriah do instead? I'm sorry, but Rick, you were just, just a tad behind. But you're right. He sleeps on the doorstep with his soldiers, right? If he hits in the hands, you've got to catch it, all right? <laughs> I don't have any butterfingers up here, no. Um... But he tries to cover it up. He tells him to go home and enjoy, enjoy his wife. He won't do it. We're going to find out why here in just one moment. So he tries the second attempt to cover it up. Let's look at verses 10 through 13. In 10 through 13 it says, When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why do you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark of Israel and Judah dwells in Bus, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go down to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. And then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also and tomorrow, and I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. And so here you have the faith of Uriah contrasted with the conniving, malicious intent of the king David, who's supposed to be not only the political leader of his people, but also the religious and leader of his people, to show purity to the people from God. And yet we see that difference. Though Bathsheba's husband was a Hittite, he appears to have been a godly believer in Yahweh and a dedicated warrior. In fact, Uriah is a part of a list, a group of men in the Old Testament. Who is he a part of? He is a member of, I'm sorry, Badardi? No, he no, wasn't a Nazarite. Yeah. Yeah, there's about 30 men who are mentioned in the Old Testament as being mighty men of, of David, right? These are like the Navy SEALs of the ancient world. I mean, some of them did remarkous feats. We're going to find that out a few chapters later in Samuel. Uriah was one of these mighty men. Not only was he a soldier, 
He was one of the best soldiers and warriors in the country. And so David tries to get him to, to do this. And he says, look, man, you know, my brothers in arms are out there on the battlefield. I mean, they're sleeping in tents. They're, they're fighting a war right now. I'm not going home. I'm not going to go enjoy my wife. I'm not going to go drink. I'm not going to eat. I'm, I'm going to stay here as long as you need me. And I'm going back and I'm going to go fight. Because they're my brothers. I'm going to do that. And so you see the resiliency of Uriah. And then so David tries to do something to cover it up. So what does David do instead? Get some drunk, Get some drunk right? Brother Rick, you've been waiting on this one, ain't you? <laughs> That's hard to throw. They're M&M's. Oh, man, that's, there's no way. Here, John, throw that to Rick. <laughs> no comment, okay. So cover up attempt number two doesn't work, right? And so let's see what happens in verses 14 through 17. Verses 14 through 17, In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there would be valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. So, is Uriah the only person that David kills in the cover-up? No, right? He kills other soldiers because he tells Joab to pretty much put them in a place where he knows that the fighting is going to be so fierce they're not going to make it out. And so not only does David have Uriah killed to cover up his transgressions, he has other innocent men killed. It's not just one life that's on David's head, it's multiple men. And so you see just how vindictive David is in his spirit and in his rationale. And so then Joab sends a report home to tell David it's been taken care of. Then Joab sent to, and told David all the news about the fighting. And he instructed the messenger, when you have finished telling all the news about the fighting of the king, then if the king's anger arises... And he says to you, Why did you go near to the city to fight? Did you not know they would shoot you from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of the uh, Jerubasheth? Did not the woman cast an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go so near to the wall? And you will say, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. And so what Joab did in battle, was it a smart move? No. He says, when you go back and you give a report to the king and they say, this, this was a dumb move, just let him know why it was a dumb move. So it's not like... It's, Joab was a brilliant military leader. I mean, these guys have conquered every kingdom except for this one kingdom, and they're fixing to conquer them too. Uh, so when he did this, people had been knowing, okay, th this is dumb. Like, there's no reason for these guys to be going to this part of the battlefield. This, this is just stupid. And so people were probably keen to the fact that something was up, uh, that this was a, a treacherous move on Joab's part, and yet he was doing it because he had been told by the king himself. And so here we see that he, listen to David's demeanor here in verses 22 through 25, as if it couldn't get any worse. Let's see if David feels bad about the innocent men who've been killed. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had set him to tell. The messenger said to David, The men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. And David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this matter trouble you, for the sword devours now one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, and encourage him. So what is David's response to the fact that Uriah and other men have died? Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, just, well, that's war. You know, I mean, imagine if your loved one was in the military, Right? And they had been killed. And the guy was just like, well, you know, it's just not how it goes. You know, just that happens. You know, the amount of disrespect and the, and the lack of concern for human life that David has here is, is astonishing. I mean, not only does David do this act, you really see David's demeanor and his spiritual state throughout chapter 11. And it's, it's not the David we read about in the previous chapters or in 1 Samuel. And so David gets away with it. He thinks he's going to get off scot-free. And there you see at the very end of chapter 11, it says, When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. 
And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her in his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And so here you have the end of chapter 11. It seems that David is going to get away with everything. He's committed murder, not against one man, but against multiple men. Multiple families are mourning because their loved ones have been killed over David's sin. And he just takes her into his house and marries her. All's forgotten. But the end of the chapter says, But God noticed, and He was listening. Even when we think that we have covered our tracks and hidden our sins, God, God is listening. He's watching, and He knows. And so here we have chapter 12, what God is going to do to take care of that stuff. And so now we get into chapter 12, and He sends Nathan the prophet. Now this takes place just before the child is born, so months have taken place. And so God has been patient with David. God has given David multiple months to repent, but He did not. He had no joy. Psalm 51, the psalm we, we read about in our devotional period tonight, says, Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Sin does that to you. It's the part, it's, it, sin doesn't bring happiness. Uh, somebody who knows what is right and what is wrong can go out and live in sin, but they're not going to be happy. Uh, they can dance, they can party, they can enjoy alcohol, they can do all these things, but in the back of their mind, when they go to sleep at night, they know what's right and they know what's wrong. And those things don't bring them peace. They bring them torment, they bring them pain, they bring, it brings them shame. And they, on the outside, they may smile and act like everything's fine, right? And that you should come along and join the party too. But for people who know the difference in right and wrong, David... Although his demeanor on the outside, he knew what he was doing was wrong, and he had no peace. And we see how David has to, how God has to get David's attention here with Nathan. Let's read verses one through four of chapter twelve. And the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought up, and it grew up with him and his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And so here we have this parable, right? Anybody here got dogs or a pet? Okay. Brittany and I were dating. Okay. I had farm dogs my whole life, right? You know, dirty, nasty, smelly, didn't come in the house. I mean, that was just a rule. So Brittany and I are starting to date. She's like, when we get married, you know, I want, I want to have an inside dog. I was like, no, I'm not having an inside dog. Dogs are outside. I mean, no, we need to have an inside dog. I was like, no. I'm like, God made dogs. They've lived outside for thousands of years. They'll be just fine. Got married, right? One year goes by. Isaac, I really want a dog. It's like, that's fine. What kind of dog you want? Put him out back. No, no, he's got to be inside. Like, no, six months. I didn't even last a year, did I? No, mercy. That's pretty bad. Six months into it, we get a dog. I'm like, he's not sleeping in the bed. He is not sleeping in the bed. First night, I roll over. I can't find Brittany. I thought she left me. No, I didn't think that. I look over. She's in the floor with the dog. And I, I said, get in bed, you know. So she won. She picked the dog over me. They let me stay there at night. Um, today's his fourth birthday. Uh... But if, if you've seen my Facebook, he's like a child, right? I mean, uh, you know, he eats, we, he eats my food. Um, we take naps together. I mean, he's, he's like a child. So when I read this passage in 1 Samuel 12, 2 Samuel 12, I can relate. I mean, if somebody hurt that dog, it'd be bad, okay? I'm just saying it'd be bad. I can't say what it will happen. But anyways, I would be crushed. I would be absolutely crushed. Think about if you've got a relationship with an animal like I do with my dog. Think about somebody coming and having a big old pack of dogs and taking your dog. I mean, those, those, that's a fighting situation. David was a shepherd. He realizes this. He gets extremely upset. Look how angry David gets here in verses 5 through 6. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, this man who has done this deserves to die, which would have been my, for my puma, been the same thing. 
And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. If you do the Hebrew there, it says like three times, he was very, very angry a lot. Like, you don't do that because it's bad English when you translate it. He was super upset and he says, this guy ought to die. And then he appeals back to the law of Moses and says, this man ought to pay back four times for what he's done. So he goes back and says, we're going to do what the law says. Right? Four times he's going to have to pay. David doesn't know if this is a hypothetical situation or not because as the king, he would have had the job of doing judicial matters. And so David may think that he's actually delegating an actual court case right now. David, under the Mosaic law, didn't owe fourfold. He was guilty of the death penalty. In Leviticus 20.10, the, uh, the penalty for adultery is death. Leviticus 24.17 the penalty for murder is death. So David was doubly convicted of the death penalty here. If he's going back to the law of Moses, which he had just done saying the man needs to pay four times restitution, Exodus 22 verse 1. And so Nathan has one of the greatest lines in the Old Testament here in verse 7. Let's look at verse 7 through 12. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you to your master's house and your master's wives and to your arms and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this were too little, I would have added to you much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down your Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and you have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up an evil against you out of your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did this in secret, but I will do this thing before all of Israel and before the sun. And so here, God talks to David, and he sets him straight big time. He says, I have blessed you more than anybody else in this world up until this point. Uh, you didn't deserve Saul's kingdom, and I gave it to you. I gave you his wives. I gave you his land. I gave you all this stuff. And here's the kicker, right? This is, what, this is what God says. If this would have been too little for you, O King David, I'd have given you more stuff if you'd just asked for it. You, you need more wives to keep you company at night? I'd have given them to you. You need more land to make you feel more like a man? I'd have given you more land. But... Since you took Uriah the wife's, since you took Uriah's wife to be your wife, I'm going to raise up an evil from your house, and the sword will never disappear from your family. I mean, God sets the record straight with David, and he knows he's being serious. Why? Why does David know that God is being serious? Nobody else knew it. He knows he's guilty. Have you already got a piece of candy? Oh, no. You, you, you caught the one John threw, right? John? Oh, sorry. Miss Clonice or, or Randy or... He knows God is serious because what happened to the last king? God made him a promise. God anointed him king over Israel, and he messed up. You might argue David messed up more than Saul did. But what's the difference between Saul and David? Well, let's continue to read our story. Verses 13 through 14, we see just the difference between Saul and David. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because of the deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who was born to you shall die. And then Nathan went to his house. And so we see these things come to fruition. Uh, Cliff Goodwin preached a sermon when I was like 15 years old. In fact, I didn't actually hear the sermon. I heard the CD of the sermon. And the, and the, and the sermon was, you may be through with sin, doesn't mean sin is through with you. Just because you repent of your sins, doesn't mean there aren't consequences. There are plenty of people in prison who have accepted Christ and been baptized for the remission of their sins. And they're as pure as a baby. And they're still on death row. You may be through with sin, 
Sin may not be through with you. Uh, there are consequences even after we are cleansed of our sins. All those things that God promised David come to pass. He took Uriah's wife, and the Lord's going to take David's wives. And we see there that uh, later on in chapter 13, verses 8 through 4, his son Amnon forces himself and rapes his sister Tamar. Absalom enters the royal harem in chapter 16, verse 22. And Adonijah tries to claim that his deceased father's concubine in 1 Kings 2, 13 through 17. All the things that God told David was going to happen even after David repented. Even after David corrected himself in the eyes of God. Even after David bears forth a son that God says is going to be king. David still had to live with the consequences of the decision that he made. Just because we come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry. He may say, you're forgiven. But that doesn't mean that you're off the hook completely. Uh, there are still consequences for our actions. And so David begs for mercy because he knows that there's going to be consequences. Yes, Absolutely. Had the baby done anything? Was he still going to die? Who was at fault? David, right? Just as you were saying before, all those innocent men who were killed, right? They, they didn't do anything. Their family suffered the loss of a loved one. A father, a son, a brother. Because of David's sin. Sin just doesn't affect us. It affects those around us. Which is why in the New Testament, right... Why is it important for a congregation to put out sin from its midst? It spreads, right? Sin doesn't take place in a vacuum, does it? That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5. He says, this guy who's sinning openly and publicly, you've got to get him out. Because if you don't, everybody else is going to start sinning too. Uh, and maybe you've known congregations like that, where people winked and batted an eye and said, you know, uh, 50 years later... You know, it is what it is. So, excellent point, Randy. Thank you so much. Uh, verses 15 through 17. David begs for mercy. And the Lord afflicted the child, and Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. And David therefore sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of the house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not and did not eat food with them. And so David refuses to eat. He refuses to do anything because he's so concerned about his son. And so the servants, when the child dies, are too afraid to even tell David the news. It says in verse 18, On the seventh day the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we say that the child is dead? He may do himself some harm. What are they afraid David is going to do when they tell him the child is dead? Anybody say kill himself besides Rick and Miss okay. Miss Weathers? Did you really say it or you just want some candy? Okay. I'm not calling you a liar. I'm just asking, okay? Oh, I told you. You better watch out. <laughs> and so they're afraid to tell David because they're afraid he's going to commit actual physical harm to himself when they tell him the child has died. But David's demeanor and his reaction completely throws them for a loop. Let's look at verses 19 and through 20. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood the child was dead. And David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. And David rose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went to the house of the Lord and worshipped. He then went to his own house. And when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. And so David's response is forward-focused. Uh, our word for this upcoming Sunday is grief. And you see how David deals with grief. And of course, I don't want to give you the cliff notes for the sermon this Sunday. But if you see what David does here in verses 19 through 20, is how the proper way to deal with grief. Uh, David realized that what is done is done. Uh, there's nothing that he could do to change what he did to Uriah or his wife. There was nothing he could do to bring the child back. There was nothing he could do in any of those situations. The only thing that he could do was the future and the present. 
And you see him putting forth his focus and his energy in that and trying to get back in the right relationship with God. We cannot go back. We must go forward. Verses 21 through 23, David explains this attitude. He says, Then his servant said to him, What is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. And so here you see David looking forward. He realizes that there's nothing else that he can do about the past, but he's got to go forward. Uh, in the midst of grief, that can be a difficult, difficult thing to do. A difficult decision because we want to dwell on the past. We want to dwell on what we did wrong. We want to dwell on the bad things and the situation that we're in. But the only way to get out of that grief is to move forward. And so here we have the son who is born to David and Bathsheba. In verses 24 through 25. Then David confronted his wife Bathsheba, comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and lay with her, and she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent a message by Nathan the prophet, and so he called his name Jedidiah, because of God. Uh, this actually means beloved of God. Jedidiah does. And so here we see, does God take out the wrath on David's son Solomon? No. Anybody remember what number Solomon was in the line? What number? What number was he? I don't want to give any hints. When I hear the right answer, you'll get candy. Anybody remember? There's not a lot of numbers left. <laughs> I'm worried about you guys. This is like last week. See, the confidence is everybody's getting lower now, so you can't hear me anymore. How many? No. Who said 10? Did you say 10? There you go, Michael. You gotta be louder, man. You're not right there in front of me, man. I'm sorry, Leroy. Could you help me out there, buddy? Thank you. Whoops. Um, and so then Joab calls for David in verses 26 through 28. Joab calls and says, "Okay, David, you need to be out here and capture the city." No, Joab fought against Rabbah the Ammonites. And took the royal city, and Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabba, moreover I have taken the city of waters. Now then gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and it be called by my name. So David gathered all the people together, and they went to Rabba and fought against it, and they took it. And then we see verses 29 through 31. God blesses David. He says, And he took the crown of their king from the head. The weight of it was a talent of gold. And it was a precious stone. And it was placed on David's head. And he brought out the spoil of the city, very great amount. And he brought out the people who were in it. And he set them to labor with saws and iron picks and iron axes. And he made them toil at the brick kiln. Kilns. And thus he did to all the cities of the Ammonites, David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. And so God is no longer going to oppress David. He's going to give him this, the Ammonite capital. Uh, literally, the translation there is the great city. And so uh, he's going to take over this empire and he's going to take the people who have not been killed in battle and make them the slaves and work for the Israelites. The main thing here is the sexual sin that David encountered. Uh, something that we've probably all dealt with. And so the things that we see here in chapter 11 and chapter 12, the question is, how do we flee sexual sin? There's five ways I think we can do that, and that is to realize your vulnerability. Uh, none of us are immune to sexual temptation. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 12 tells us that we've got to take heed lest we fall. Uh, David had a dozen wives. Uh, he had plenty of wives. Right? He had plenty of places he could have went for physical attention. Right? He was 50 years old. I mean, you'd you think the man would have been grown up enough to know what not to do. Right? Um, 
but people will surprise you. Uh, you've got to realize that we are all vulnerable, right? We have to keep our guard up at all times. The second thing is we've got to cultivate a daily commitment to the Lord. We cannot afford to live one day without a relationship with our Lord and Savior. Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 13 says that we've got to put away those temptations daily. We're not living for that sinful, fleshly man anymore, right? We're living for our spiritual Lord and Savior, right? We're living for Christ. And so we've got to renew that commitment each and every day. Uh, when I was a kid, my mom had a saying. She said, remember who you are and whose you are. Right? That's good for 12-year-olds. It's also good for 72-year-olds and everybody in between, right? We've got to remember our commitment to the Lord. The third thing that we've got to do is cultivate an intimacy with our spouse. Uh, we've got to be... Um, connected to them, and be content with the relationship that we have to them. Um, uh, there's an old saying that, that somebody... Uh, uh, there was a story about a guy, right? An old farmer. And his wife was complaining because the husband never told her that he loved her. And she went to the preacher. It's a joke. It's not a funny joke. But she was like, he never tells me he loves me and all this stuff. And the preacher's like, I'm concerned about you and your relationship with your wife because she tells me that you never loved her. And he's like, well, I married her 45 years ago. And if I change my mind, I'll let her know. You know, and so, as like I said, it's not that funny, right? But some people have that mentality, right? You know, I'm, of course she knows I love her. Well, why? Because I pay the bills. Well, listen here, Romeo. You know, that's important. But you might could do some other stuff too, right? Right, babe? I know. I'm listening to myself, too. Okay. Uh, the fourth thing that we've got to do is to cultivate accountability with our spouse, right? We've got to be an open book. Um, they should know your passwords. You know, we live in a digital age. They should know your stuff, right? You shouldn't, your spouse shouldn't have to ask you where you've been or what you've been doing. You know, your life's not a secret. I mean, when, when the two become one flesh, they become one flesh. Uh, we have a commitment to each other, and we should be accountable to each other. The fifth thing is to anticipate and avoid temptation. Uh, if you feel like you're uh, physically attracted to somebody, uh, don't spend time near or around them. Uh, don't say something to someone else that you wouldn't say if your spouse or their spouse was standing right there in your midst. I mean, it's just uh, simple things that we can do that can avoid, that can avoid um, a lifetime of, of regret and shame. And uh, it attacks everybody. No, no family is immune. No church is immune. I mean, we've probably all experienced it uh, in our fa families, friends, congregations. Uh, anybody can fall victim to this type of temptation. And so we've got to be sure that we're smarter than a king. Because if David could fall to this temptation, any of us can too. And so that's the takeaway from chapters 11 and 12, is that if we are relying on our relationship with God in the New Testament through Christ Jesus, that we can avoid any type of temptation that Satan might throw our way, whether it be of a physical nature, a spiritual nature, whatever it might be, right? Even chocolate, even candy. Are there any questions or comments from our class today? Brother Ed? Well, yeah. So, there you go. So, um, I have to ask Brittany what my password is sometimes. And then we're both like, well, I don't know. And then you get in a whole can of worms. you got to set a new one. And it's like, no, that was, your, that was the one two times ago. you got to change it again. It's like, I don't know. And then, like, some people have it all written down on a piece of paper beside the computer. And I'm like, is that really, <laughs> really safe? Uh, we've gotten off track, I'm sorry. Um, yes, Miss Joy, you go ahead and you get those passwords, okay? Or you let me know if he doesn't give them to you. All right? I don't give Brittany the password of the checkbook. That's a different story altogether, okay? All right. Uh, any, any other comments or questions? Uh, thank you so much for your attendance and your comments. I'm sorry about I was really thinking with two chapters we would get more time for uh, discussion and questions. Uh, but once again, I talk too much. Um, thank you so much, and uh, I really appreciate your attendance. Next week, we're going to be talking about chapters 13 through 15, and we're going to see the family start to fall apart. Uh, David has this wonderful family around him, but because of David's sins, that God foretold that the consequences were going to be in chapter 12, we just read in chapter 13, 
through about chapter 18, you're going to see all those things start to take place. And David's family is going to cause him a lot of heartache and headaches. And so we'll start that next week about the family falling apart in chapters 13 through 15. If there's no uh, questions or comments, we'll end with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and for all the many blessings you've given us. We're so thankful for the ability that we have to read and study your word and apply it to our lives. Dear Heavenly Father, we hope and pray that we will take the lesson of David and Bathsheba to heart and realize that whatever temptation might befall us, that none of us are so strong or so independent that we can rely on our own selves to get us through the situation, but that we need you and your Son and your grace and mercy to help get us through those temptations. Help us to rely on each other as as spouses, as married uh, individuals, or even as the congregation here at Chapel Hill. Help us to be your people and exude a, a purity and a holiness that attracts other people to you and your church. Please be with us and watch over us. Your son's name we pray. Amen.